Hello, everyone. Give a few more seconds for people to join in if they would like. Um, and during that time, I'll introduce myself so you know who this person is that's yapping at you. My name is Brenda Antrim. I'm one of the reference librarians here at Santa Monica College. Um, a little, orient, uh, little introduction because when somebody sits in front of you and says, hi, I'm an expert, your immediate reaction should be to say, um, what are your credentials? So um, I'm old. I started college in 1981, finished my second master's degree in 2008 after a stint in the Air Force. And uh, I hold degrees in information science and communication critical studies. Um, so fake news is under my purview in both of those degrees, really. And I've been at Santa Monica College Library for 21 years now. So what that means for you um, as a student is that I have 25 years of being a librarian teaching people how to use resources and about 30 years of being a college student and using those resources. So um, I've got experience sort of on both sides of the, of the desk, as it were. So what we're going to do for this um, particular workshop, because I'm doing this on my own, um, I'm going to be showing you and talking to you about various things. And what I would like you to do is, if you have questions, please put them in the chat box. And a couple of times throughout the presentation, I'll stop and I'll take the chat questions and then I'll go back to the presentation. Because if I bounce back and forth between the two, I will get completely confused. And I have the attention span of a cat in a room full of laser pointers. So we'd like to keep this on topic as much as possible. Um, so let me go ahead and share my screen with you. And I'm gonna start off with the PowerPoint. And Okay. So today's workshop is not necessarily just fake news. It's how to improve your information literacy skills so that you can find real news and not be fooled by fake news. So why, uh, how can news be fake? Why do we call it fake news? The short answer to that is news can't be fake. <laughs> news by its uh, definition uh, must be factual information. So what we call fake news is other information that is presented as if it were news. So um, sometimes a news story is taken and it's twisted um, and presented in such a way that it means something different than what it actually is. Um, sometimes that information is completely made up. Um, sometimes information that is actually an opinion is presented as if it were a fact. And this is one of the most common forms of um, fake news. Um, the other type of fake news is um, some sort of deliberately created or popularly believed information that is also not true or news. It could be conspiracy theories. It could be unverified claims. People just say it's true and therefore we must all believe it. No, it might be state sponsored propaganda and state in this case could be um, the United States, China, Russia, Iran, anywhere. Um, and propaganda has a particular meaning that I'm going to talk about a little bit later in the presentation. Um, it might um, and often is used specifically to promote disharmony between people. So that might be between races, between men and women, it might be homophobia, it might be um, any form of um, disruption and dislike or even hatred between people. And it's used to foment that and make it worse. Um, and it is also very attention grabbing. So a lot of websites will use uh, exaggerated or misleading headlines to get you to click on them or images that have often been doctored to get you to click on them. Okay. So these are all things that masquerade as news and we call them fake news, but they're not news. They're anything but. So I'm going to um, show you a YouTube video right now and here's hoping it actually works. Hey, I just read an unbelievable article. Okay. Hey, listen to this. It says here that the Cincinnati Zoo is trying to bring Harambe back from the dead Frankenstein style. Yo, I would definitely go see I'd it. I'd go That's see it. Dope. That's amazing. Okay, but like we can't bring gorillas back to life. Okay, yeah, but it says CNN though. 
No, that says CMM. It's fake news. And that's not a credible news source. 100% fake news. You got to be careful because that's just going around right now. Oh, yeah, I wasn't listening to anything you just said. You have to read this, though. It says you, Mamadou, own a dolphin. Yeah, I got that too. <laughs> I don't own a dolphin. I don't own a dolphin. I don't know, man. I mean, we haven't been to your apartment in a couple months now. That wasn't even CMM, that was MSABC. The epitome of truth. See, no ability to raise aquatic life in here, it's just me and my roommate. Wow, uh, yeah, I totally thought there was enough room for a pool in here. Oh my God, this article from Shamu.Freedom Eagle says you kicked a gay dolphin out of your house because you don't approve of its lifestyle choices? What is that? What's Shamu.Freedom Eagle? It doesn't even make sense. Oh, fuck, man. Okay, I'm gay. <laughs> Are you gonna like kick me out of your home next? Is that what you're gonna do? No, I'm gonna never do that. Oh my God, Shamiroquai is dead. Who is Shamiroquai? <laughs> Who is Shamiroquai? Um, he's your gay dead dolphin son. I don't yeah. have a son. I, I, okay, I'm not a homophobe. I'm not. You know, you should be ashamed of yourself. Son. I don't have a gay dolphin son, guys. Come on, yes. this is all fake what news, guys. Guys, none of this is real. While we're in here arguing over whether dolphins and humans can have kids, Donald Trump's out there banning Muslims from his country. Yeah. No, but like, I really want to talk about this dolphin yeah, thing. So I think it's a little bit more pressing. So pressing. I mean, look at Shamir it. Shamir was a fashion voice of our generation. I can't believe you already forgot so dolphin. Cool. What's wrong? Dude, people keep believing all these fake news stories about killing tacos. Who heard about that? Resurrecting gorillas. People thinking that humans and dolphins. People just need to apply a little bit of logic to the situation. That's it. But they're not doing that. I totally get what you're saying. Oh, thank God. What you're doing isn't easy. So brave. <laughs> what? Because I have a gay son? No, because you're raising a dolphin. And so far from salt water. So, so brave. I didn't tell you that. How did you know? News travels fast. Wait. Fake news, it's all around. It's happening. It seems fake, but it's not. It's very it's so real. real. I, thought, I thought you were dead. So yes, it is contagious, right? Now, there are a couple of things in that video that I sort of wanted to point out a little bit. The one point that sticks out to me is this young man tried to tell his friends there are important news stories going on right now. And you're so caught up in all of this weird stuff that is put up there that people are making up that you're missing the important news that is actually affecting the country. And that's why it is so important that we know about fake news. We're living in what's known today by many people as a post-truth era. I personally dislike this term because it gives legitimacy to something that is not legitimate. Um, but what it means is essentially that we are um, paying attention with our hearts and not with our heads. That we are being influenced and our opinions are being created by thinking um, things that appeal to our personal beliefs and our emotions are actually more important and more truthful than facts which can be proven. There have been a couple of studies that have been done recently. Um, and a couple of years ago, the Pew Research Center, which is a major think tank, came up with uh, the conclusion that people tend to label those things they agree with as fact and those things they disagree with as opinion, regardless of the actual truthfulness and factual nature of those things. And then last year, um, Ohio State University did a psychology study um, and people actually draw distinctions between dishonest and biased sources. But the problem is that news, even accurate news, if it's reported by one of these um, outlets that people consider to be biased or dishonest, even if it's the truth, they disbelieve it. And that's bad. That's bad for the people getting their, their um, information. It's also bad for the journalistic outlets. Um, so 
it's almost like feeding off of one another. I don't believe it's true, therefore, no matter what they say, it's not true, even if it's true. So it's a logical fallacy that you have to be aware of when you're evaluating information. Another thing that is symbiotic is our relationship with news, with the media, period. We are living essentially in the center of a media stream. And so we tend to say, okay, I'm going to do my research. I've heard this claim. I go online. I Google it. The first thing that I see agrees with me. Therefore, I am proven correct. That's lazy research. <laughs> so not just for your, for your research papers or your essays or presentations, but for your own um, life experience, please be aware of that logical fallacy and don't fall into it. Do a little deeper, dig a little deeper. Okay. So there are some things that make it tough for us to find the difference between news and not news. One is this confirmation bias. When we find information online or elsewhere, we hear a, a supposed expert talking about it. If we agree with them, it confirms our own bias and then we agree with it and we believe it even more. We also um, self-isolate, um, particularly in social media. And so it's not like social distancing. It's an opinion isolation. It's a factual isolation. We are living in a, an era of echo chambers where we friend people who sound like us and we have people friend us who believe the same things that we believe. Um, and if anything comes across, manages to get through that bubble and it disagrees with what we believe, then we think people are picking a fight with us or they're attacking us and we become defensive and we're even less apt to listen to them. And this is a very, very bad thing because if we're going to come to a place where people who are different can come to understandings, reach compromises, go forward together. We can't just listen to one side of a story. There are multiple sides of every story and we have to open our ears and open our hearts and open our minds to hear those various stories and engage in that dialogue or we can't go forward and we'll never be able to figure out what is fact and what is fiction because we're only hearing our part of that story. I'll talk a little bit more about filter bubbles later on in this presentation. This is all made even worse by the fact that we are living in an age of information overload. We have more information to us available in a day or two now than our grandfathers did their entire lives. And it's building daily. And there's very little order to it. So when you see things flow across your screen, news and research and opinion and speculation and lies all come in at the exact same level and it's really really difficult to sift through that so how do you well i'm going to give you some tools toward the end of this presentation but basically patience and practice and don't avoid information it's not just avoiding opinions that differ from you it's avoiding facts that support viewpoints that are different than yours. Um, so one of the ways that we learn, one of the ways that we grow, and one of the ways that we learn to get along with people who are different than ourselves, because we can't go forward as a society until we do that, is we stop avoiding information that makes us uncomfortable. Because you can't grow unless you break your shell a little bit. And the main place where this is happening, particularly now during the pandemic when we're all socially distanced from one another, is via social media. Um, on the whole, over half of Americans get their news beginnings, either their actual news stories or their starting place to figure out news um, via social media. Um, Facebook is used primarily by older readers and other social media platforms, Instagram, for example, are used by younger. Um, in this whole mix of various platforms on social media, Facebook's newsfeed is the primary driver of traffic to news sites. So that means um, people read stuff that comes through their Facebook feed, their opinions are formed by it. And I'm going to read this because I think it's important. It's a stream of information that is curated and limited 
by the things that will make you uncomfortable. You will not provide equal airtime to opposing viewpoints in this environment. So um, in a way that's good because the fact that the newsfeed is driving people to the original source means they're checking that source. But in a way it's also bad because we're getting into the habit and have gotten into the habit of um, evaluating very quickly, going by gut instinct. And gut instinct cannot necessarily be trusted when so many things look alike, truth and lies both. So I mentioned the filter bubble and that looks graphically a little bit like this. <clears throat> Whether this is your Facebook, your Twitter, your um, Instagram feed, your news feed that you get sent to your phone, it is made up of things and brands and opinions and news sources that you agree with or that you like. We are being tracked all of the time. This is what big data is. And that tracking it allows these various news feeds and merchandising and um, opinion makers to latch on to those people that they can sell to. So that's where that comes from. Um, the feed that is not yours, <laughs> that differs from yours, has all of those facts and brands and news and opinions and people that make you uncomfortable. Um, it's a good idea to get used to being uncomfortable because that means you're opening up to new ways of thinking and looking. We all need to sort of retreat a little bit every day in order to recharge our batteries and have that comfort zone. But during the day, throughout the day, seek out those things that you don't know, that you don't understand that are different um, and make a habit of that. And that will also help you as you evaluate information because you'll see information from more than one perspective. Okay. Now, not only has the way that we um, absorb, incorporate, and use news changed, but journalism itself has gone through a sea change in the last 20 years. Um, Emily Bell, who was the director of the Tau Center for Digital Journalism at Columbia University, talked about the impact of social media on journalism. And she said, and I believe it, that the news ecosystem has changed more dramatically in the last decade than it has in the last 500 years. There's less control um, over the voice that's being heard because social media opens that voice up. Um, there's also less control over the fact checking that goes into it before it's absorbed by people. Um, so add to that the fact that journalistic outlets news stations, radio stations, newspapers have been consolidated more and more and more into the hands of just a few. And these businesses are not necessarily in the business of truth telling. They're in the business of making a profit. So if a story is ugly or painful and also necessary, it may be less apt to be published or broadcast than a story that is fluffy and cute um, or a story that um, most people believe in. If it is a corporation that owns the news outlet and they have a particular partisan viewpoint, they may actually overlay that viewpoint, and this is happening a lot in local news, over the words of trusted newscasters. So people see a face that they've trusted for the last 25 years to give them their news but the words that are coming out are scripted by a corporate owner. Um, and you may not necessarily know this. I'm not trying to ramp up your paranoia. I just want you to be aware of the news scape out there and that it is um, not what it once was. Um, it's also, uh, I've heard newscasters who've been in the, in the field for decades say that there is also a, a very good side to this by breaking open the sort of, uh, hold on news that major corporations that like the, the big three network newscasters had, that allows diverse voices to tell stories that otherwise would not have been heard. Um, on the other hand, a lot of those stories are not being told because they can't get a platform. Um, so they lose some legitimacy. So there are a lot of things that are going into this. Um, 
one of the worst to me, the worst part uh, of what news publishers are doing these days is that, and I'm going to read this because again, I also think this is important. Um, news is being filtered through algorithms and platforms on social media, not necessarily news, that are opaque and unpredictable. Social media companies have become overwhelmingly powerful in determining what we read, what we believe, and enormously profitable from the monetization of other people's work. There's a greater concentration of power in this respect than there has ever been in the past. So much as we have more diverse voices being heard, contrarily at the same time, we have less and less and less control um, because that control is being gathered into the hands of just a few corporations. Now this diagram is a little bit older, um, but I like it and I use it because I think it's one of the clearest um, layouts of the partisan landscape for news. It is biased, by the way, everything is biased um, because it comes from human beings. We have our own prejudices, positive, negative, or neutral that informs what we do. It also means any time that you have something um, that uses judgment, I determine this is more conservative, I determine this is more liberal, it is necessary because judgment infers um, a, a form of bias. I am using these particular criteria. My bias, my prejudice informs those criteria. Um, bias is not necessarily a bad thing if you are aware it is there. And that's why this graph, for example, is so helpful. Now there's a lot of information, so I'm gonna lay it out and then break it out a little bit more. In the center, we have the mainstream, which is minimal partisan bias, not none because that doesn't exist, but minimal. And then to the left and to the right, we have a category of news information that skews liberal or skews conservative. And then a little bit further than that, we have the hyperpartisan liberal and hyperpartisan conservative, where the journalism begins to have more questionable value because the partisanship becomes more important than the news. And then at the far ends, we have utter garbage and conspiracy theories. Okay, so as you take a look at this, <clears throat> I'm going to start from the center again and go out. Um, NBC, CBS, and ABC are the original uh, broadcast news centers that still have major outlets around the world where, they're, where they gather news on the ground. Um, <clears throat> they're relatively in the center. CBS a little bit more conservative, NBC a little bit more liberal, but relatively center. AP and Reuters are also relatively center because they are news wires. They gather news and then they sell it to everyone. So they sell it to news outlets on both sides of the partisan divide. The Washington Post and the New York Times are me, long-standing national newspapers and they're relatively left of center, but not by very much. They're still mainstream. Um, and then NPR um, is actually, and PBS um, were actually created with the public good in mind. So they have a slightly different charge and a different approach. Um, keeping in mind that with cuts in funding in the last several years, they've had to make sure that their work um, informs and is addressed to an audience that can pay for them to do that work. Um, so they have a balance issue between a more um, economically elite audience that will pay for them and the charge to be for the public good. So. Um, but they at least have that charge for the public good, which the private companies do not. Um, and then um, sort of a little bit further over, you have um, the large portions of Fox News, which sort of straddles the line and falls into hyper conservative um, territory. And then you have the Huffington Post, which also straddles the line and then falls into hyper partisan liberal territory. So one source <coughs> like Huffington or Fox can actually have good journalistic integrity and then other things that have much less integrity and are much more about a partisan viewpoint. So just be aware when you're looking at them that um, 
yes, there's a bias behind everything, but that bias can truly skew the news to the point that it is distorted and is no longer news and becomes false. Um, by the way, I will be having this um, video with these slides um, published to the library homepage after this is over. So if you want to take a look at it and see, okay, well, I found this thing and it's from the Fiscal Times. Where does that fall? It'll give you at least some sort of an idea of where they fall on the spectrum of partisanship. Now, I mentioned it just generally, but one of the most um, pernicious quiet, painful problems that we are going through is the gutting of the Federal Communication Commission and their ability to regulate ownership of media outlets. Um, there are so many loopholes at this point that ownership rules might as well be Swiss cheese. Um, and the consolidation of ownership has gotten to the point where it's incredibly difficult to find any independent news outlet, print or broadcast of any sort. Um, so uh, I've listed a link from NPR that has, um, at that time, all of the various consolidations. And um, just be aware that because journalism outlets are owned by so few people, um, what comes out is what will sell, not necessarily what is needed for people to know. Okay. <clears throat> and it's not just the regular news sources that have this problem. So I'm going to uh, show you a video that's a case study of what happened in the 2016 election. And we have to wait for the video. At least it's for avocados. Avocados are tasty. At the start of 2016, in a small town called Velas in Macedonia, an 18-year-old high school student discovered that he could make more money than his parents by building fake news sites. To protect his identity, we'll call him Boris. And here's how he did it. He wrote tons of false articles about the U.S. election, most of them salacious. The articles were shared on Facebook, garnering tons of traffic. So much so that Boris's most popular website earned him $16,000 over the course of a few months. That's way higher than the average monthly salary in Macedonia, which is $371. So, Boris dropped out of high school. And he was not alone. In the final weeks of the election, there were more than 100 political websites registered to Bellis. The most popular stories were pro-Trump, but that's not because Boris and his fake news publishers liked the candidate. They just like the money. Trump supporters just happen to be more likely to share fake news. Researchers tracked 30 million shares of pro-Trump stories on Facebook in the months before the election. But why were companies advertising on fake news sites? They weren't directly. Those ads were placed by services like Google AdSense or AppNexus, which act as intermediaries between advertisers and small-time publishers like Boris. They negotiate how much ads cost and manage payments from advertisers to publishers. Those ads follow people wherever they go online. Remember when you recently searched for that onesie? Well, that search was tracked and matched with advertisers selling that product. So everywhere you go on the web, a onesie ad follows. Advertisers and these services create blacklists of sites they won't advertise against. But it's hard to keep up. So sometimes they pop up on fake news sites that haven't been discovered yet. While Boris and his friends were making money, fake news became one of the major scandals of the 2016 elections. Many wondered if sites like Boris's even helped Trump win. A joint study by NYU and Stanford University found that it may not have tipped the election as much as one would think. It found that one fake news story would need to be as persuasive as 36 TV commercials to swing a voter. Still, the backlash forced tech giants like Google and Facebook to do something. Facebook is now partnering with fact-checking organizations like Snopes and PolitiFact to flag articles that present deliberately misleading content. Google now cuts off AdSense revenue to sites with spoof domains like NewYorkTimesPolitics.com. But that's still flagging fake news after it's been published and shared. So tech companies like Moat propose combining algorithms with human insight to catch fake news before it spreads.
So as you see, not only are people um, distorting the news because of partisanship or because of propaganda, but because of money. Not only do um, news articles with a particular bias um, be more popular amongst certain audiences and therefore gain more money, but there's a cottage industry of creating fake news. Um, and it's very, very sophisticated. Huh. So problems, how do we do this? Well, the first way to figure out how to avoid fake news is to look at the different forms it might take. It might be clickbait. It might be propaganda. It might be out of context or misleading. It might be a conspiracy theory. And it might be satire. You can see those definitions here a little bit. And going here. Satire is perhaps the one we're most familiar with um, and recognize it. So for example, um, if you're watching Trevor Noah or Seth Meyers on YouTube, um, then that's satire. They are using humor and um, ridicule to criticize, to criticize, sorry, to expose and criticize um, things that people are doing that they see as being um, harmful, wrong, or not intelligent. Um, another example of this is Stephen Colbert. Um, sort of an opinion, or sort of a, a satirist, but at the same time blending into opinion would be John Oliver. Um, he has longer pieces and the pieces do deep research actually before they're brought on and um, present actual news that can be fact checked, but it has a definite perspective that he's presenting it through and he uses um, often adult humor in order to really drive it home. So that's a, a specific kind of satire. Um, it might be an opinion. An opinion is a little bit more than idea, a little less than fact, um, and something that can't be proved. So I might say Diet Coke is the best soda ever. Somebody else might say, tastes like battery acid. And I would be like, why are you drinking battery acid? And then that would be a whole different conversation. So opinion has a way of diverting you away from the topic at hand. Clickbait is deliberately designed to catch your attention make you click on it, and then go to some sort of content, an image, a video, a, a story um, that is buzzy, but usually not truthful. Um, or if it is truthful, it's twisted or distorted in some way. So for example, BuzzFeed had a real uh, headline a while back, simple pleasures that may actually be better than sex, which of course people are gonna click on that, right? And then the last one is propaganda. I mentioned earlier that this can come from states, it can come from organizations, but there are ideas or statements that um, are often blown out of proportion and then deliberately spread to either help or attack a cause, a leader, or a government. Okay. So all the time, all the way through this, we're halfway through this work workshop and people's brains are probably going, oh my God, how do I fix this? How do I figure this out? Well, there are some ways that you can do that. One way that you should always do it um, is check multiple sources. If you look at a report from um, a news outlet that has a liberal bias and a news outlet that has a, a conservative bias and a relatively mainstream source, they could have a wildly different report of that same event. But the one thing that they all have in common, that little kernel of story that is the same between them, that's the true part. Um, check original sources. I have often heard um, news reports and even call-in shows where um, authors of original research will call in and they'll say, I know that this person said this because that's politically what they wanted to put forward, but that's not what it meant. And if you read the paper, if you read the research that I did, you'll see that that's not the, the conclusion I drew at all. So if you can, if somebody says, well, blah, blah said this, find blah, blah. Take a look at their paper. See if you agree. 
with that interpretation that was given, or if you have a different interpretation. Check the site, not the feed. You can go to latimes.com. You can go to newyorktimes.com. You can go to US News Stream, which is a database that you have access to as a Santa Monica College student. That one database gives you the 10 major national newspapers, several regional newspapers, and some local newspapers from as far ago, back as 25 years ago to today's newspaper. It is updated daily. And it searches all of them with one search. And then it retrieves the article for you and gives it to you. So you don't have to go site to site to site to site to find it. But you can find it through an aggregator like a database. Okay, so there are various ways you can do it. Um, but check the source. Don't necessarily believe what people tell you right off the bat. You know, check it. Double check it. And through practice and evaluation and a critical eye, know the difference between satire, propaganda, opinion, etc. And it does become easier because after you've looked at them for a long time, it gets easier and easier and easier for your eye to catch the little tells. For example, in that first video, MSABC is not a real site. MSNBC is. <coughs> Excuse me. So those sorts of tells will help you determine, oh, this is somebody trying to fake us out, right? Along, as, along with doing those actions, there are some um, sort of behavioral things you can do too. And some technological things. Read outside your bubble search out those opinions and those, those ideas and those voices that differ from your own. Figure out your own biases. This is really, really hard to do. But what you can do is, you know when you're reading news and um, you, you find yourself nighting along with a the, with the story and going, oh my God, oh, that's so true. Or you're reading a, a news article and you're like, I don't buy this at all. Find a website um, that you nod along a lot Find another website, news site, that you shake your head a lot and read them both. Um, because those things you're shaking your head at, um, those are negative biases. Those things you're nodding at, those are positive biases. And the better you know yourself, the easier it is eventually to sort of filter those biases away a bit. And again, to look at news with your mind and not with your heart. The technological things you can do include minimizing your electronic footprint. Now, most of us read the news via some device, our laptop, our iPad, our phone. Um, that tracking that I mentioned earlier in the presentation follows you, um, and it also forms your news feed, even if you're not necessarily aware of that. So the way you can minimize your electronic footprint is log out of everything, your email, your all of your social media platforms, your um, Discord, everything that you're in, log out of it, empty your cache, dump your cookies. In other words, scrub your background as much as you possibly can. Open a new browser and go directly to the news source, like go directly to CNN, go directly to AP or Reuters, whatever you're going to. And you will notice that the news stories, even when you go to the site, are different when it can recognize you and when it can't recognize you. The other thing you can do is go into Google and change your um, advertising and your history. Um, toggle off to, for them to like follow you along in your video, uh, in your YouTube history. Toggle off for them to follow along in your shopping history. Yeah, it means you have to redo searches as you go, but if you keep that off, it minimizes your electronic footprint even more because Google and other trackers spread that information to every device that you're on under your login. Okay? So minimize your electronic footprint and then go to those sites. And finally, look at fact checking sites. There are several, they have different strengths. So you might look um, uh, more than one if you have something that you're unsure of. And these fact checking sites, they, uh, stake their reputation and their funding on being as neutral as possible. 
So that means that eventually, if you look through their stories, they will support a little bit of everybody because at one time or another, everyone will tell the truth at least once. They will also tick off everybody because at some time or another, everybody tells a lie. So one of the nice things about fact checkers is they, um, and I'm going to show you a couple of these, they will show you where they get their facts from. So that goes back to go to the source. So here are some, there are many, many, um, and I'm going to pick a couple just to show you. Um, one is Snopes. I like Snopes. I also like Fact Check. PolitiFact um, uh, is another excellent one. In fact, it won a Pulitzer Prize for um, its fact checking. Um, the Washington Post Fact Checker. Um, the Washington Post is a major national newspaper and has been for many, many decades. And it is in the middle, in the mainstream of the partisan bias. But the fact checker itself is separated even from their news reporting and is more neutral than their news reporting. Okay. So I'm going to just pick fact check to take you there and have you see what it looks like. As you go through, you can ask a question and it will give you a full answer. Okay. So it will take a claim that is made and then it will take a look at it. So just picking one that I haven't looked at yet. It will show you the source material that they are questioning. And then it will quote various things where they get their information. Here's the story that goes in depth on that. Okay. It has transcripts. So we're actually looking at the words that people said, not what they think they said. It uh, talks about past events and it links to those various past events that they also reported on. It brings in social media sources. So once again, we are looking at the words that were spoken or written, not the words that people remember using. Okay. So fact checkers like this. And let's take another one. Let's take a look at Snopes. You see what I buy. Yes, they track me. Um, and it tells you a little bit about what Snopes is. It gives you ideas of how you can use it and a frequently asked question. Now, I don't know about anybody else, but murder hornets scare me to death. Our bees are already facing enough, and now there's this huge hornet that kills like 50 people a year in Japan that has come over and will de decapitate bees. I'm like, what? What? So I take a look at this and I'm like, what? Is this real? Well, maybe, maybe not. This is mostly true. Japanese honeybeans, honeybeans, yes, honeybees can form hot defensive bee balls that can like surround the giant hornet and cook it. But on the other hand, not all honeybees have that defense. And I'm not sure how many Japanese honeybees we have in the US. So one of the nice things about Snopes is it goes into great detail. And here is that murderous, we're going to kill that murder wasp. It may cook a few of us. We're going to make sure that none of the other bees get their heads chopped off. So yeah, this is vaguely terrifying. Okay. And if they can't tell a lot about a topic, they will tell you. But then they'll go take a look and see what they could find. And when National Geographic calls it hornets from hell, you know it's terrifying. So those are various fact checkers that you can take a look at. And I highly recommend them. Okay. Now, as a review, how to spot fake news in eight things. And people are like, why don't you put this at the very beginning? And I'm like, then nobody would ever listen to the rest of the presentation. And there's more to it than just the summary. But in general, consider the source. Check and figure out, um, if you can, the authority of the people responsible for that information. Check the author. How old is it? Is it something that's four years old that's being recontextualized? In other words, taken out of context and used to support a particular opinion? Check your own biases to the best that you can. Read beyond the headlines. Are there any supporting sources? Check those supporting sources. 
is it a joke? And ask an expert if you're unsure. Now I see uh, a chat has come up, so I'm going to take a quick look at chat and see if there are any questions. Oh, very good. A couple of them. Yep. One is informational. And this is from Lisa, in case you can't see chat um, on your box. A bill from 2012, um, HR 4310, Section 1078 of the 2013 National Defense Authorization Act, appears to have allowed some flexibility with little journalistic sourcing. It was voted in by a Republican majority House of Representatives and signed by Obama, so it doesn't appear to be politically swayed one way or another. I'm wondering how much of an impact this has on what we are dealing with currently in regards to fake news. That is an outstanding question. And my gut instinct, which you should never go by, but my gut instinct is to say, well, yeah, probably a bit. Um, we're not the only ones who don't check our sources. Sometimes politicians don't either. So between the consolidation of sources, you know, the consolidation of power, um, the so sexy stories sell better than necessary ugly stories, um, between the lack of governmental oversight and the gutting of the commissions that are intended to do that, um, and the uh, multiple voices that are squeezing the news industry, um, this would be a fantastic question to write an essay on. Just say. Um, and also, thank you, Lisa. Excellent question. Now, if you are coming and, and viewing this, you guys are not because you're watching it in person. But if you are watching this later on um, and you want to get extra credit for it, you need a word. Um, since I can't give you a signature, since we're not in person, instead, I'm going to give you um, a word that you can tell your teachers so that they will give you credit for this. Um, and that word is, I, I was gonna use a different word, but I just changed my word. That word is bias, B-I-A-S. So the word for you to use um, to get extra credit for this if you are viewing the video is bias, B-I-A-S. Okay. And now there's some other places that you can look to read more about it. The Association of College and Research Libraries um, has a blog on information literacy. Um, Harvard has an outstanding library guide on information literacy. And uh, Nicole Cook is um, one of the leading researchers in this area and has an excellent Pinterest. In fact, I got the first video that you watched today from her Pinterest page. So. Now the last thing that we're going to do, does anybody else have any questions? I'm keeping an eye sort of over on the chat. So if anybody has any questions on anything that we've covered today, um, please let me know. Okay. So um, what I would like you to do right now is I would like you to write down or take a picture of the URL for this game. Because sometime now, later at your leisure, I would like you to go to Factitious and play this game. Um, this game is uh, specifically to help you uh, get practice in recognizing the difference between false and true news. Okay. So I'm going to take a look at that and we will take a little bit just to sort of show you how the game goes. Oh, and this is new, they have a pandemic edition. So I'm going to head into the pandemic edition to see what I know, which is probably not nearly as much as I think. So I'm not gonna sign in. I don't care about saving my score. I just wanna take a look at it. Uh, now, as you can see, you can do this on your phone. Okay, you can use the check or the X or you can swipe left or right. So what it does is it gives you a news story. And a lot of people immediately say, oh, I don't believe that. Or, oh my God, that sounds like just exactly what my cousin went through. Well, the first thing it allows you to do is it allows you to take the initiative to show the source. I may or may not recognize New York Daily News. 
And I do notice that it is NY Daily News and not MY Daily News. Okay. Then I can say, I believe it, I don't believe it, and go from there. I can't do this on my phone, sadly. But you could. Okay. Ah, okay. So thank you very much for coming to my presentation on fake news. If anyone has any questions, um, please do use your chat. Um, and if you are viewing this, as I said earlier, and you need a code word to get extra credit, that code word is BIAS, B-I-A-S. Now, the last thing I'm going to show you before we leave, I'm not seeing any chats, so that is either really good or really bad. <laughs> Thank you. The last thing that I'm going to show you before we leave is the college um, library homepage. And the reason why I want to show you that, that's my owl, he's very cute, is because I want to show you where you can find these workshops and also where you can find help. If you go to the school homepage, Mouse Over Student Services, and click on Library between Health and the Police, it will take you to the library homepage. Once there, we have an Ask a Librarian button where you can get assistance from a librarian 24-7. Um, if it's not an SMC librarian, we're part of an international consortium, so it might be a librarian from another college or university, but it is a college or university librarian who can help you. And down here, we have links to both upcoming workshops and videos of past workshops. We have research guides, which would be really helpful if you're doing, say, an English paper or a business paper and you need some assistance and you're, or you're doing MLA citation and you're a little stuck. We have a YouTube channel that has a number of video database tours. And then we have search areas right up here where you can look for articles, you can look for books, et cetera. So if you get stuck, Ask a librarian. Okay. So checking the chat one last time. Ah, okay, yes. Um, yes, go ahead and um, let the professor know the date, the title of the workshop, the link if possible, which it will be, you know, in a couple of hours, we'll have it up on the library homepage, and the word bias as the um, code word. And yes, um, this is actually something that I think everybody should hear. So I'm going to broadcast it. My apologies. My apologies. Um, turning, uh, not turning off your cookies in history, but actually clearing your cache and clearing your cookies. So if you go into the history um, and you can actually clear your cookies across all your devices, um, that will make you less recognizable. Um, and it will uh, moderate your news stream a bit so that you get a broader view of the news when you go to the sites and take a look. Okay. okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming and um, stay well and contact Ask a Librarian if you need any help. You use the code for extra credit by emailing your instructor letting them know which workshop you went to. My name is actually right here underneath my little picture. Um, so that's the instructor. And then the code word is BIAS, B-I-A-S. Okay. Excellent. Be well, everybody. And let me stop recording.